the Northampton Conservation Commission for the 8th of April, 2021. The commission is a group of unpaid volunteers who work to protect the natural environment of Northampton. We are concerned with the aid interest defined in the Wetlands Act uh, and our duties also include open space acquisition and management. We operate in a way that's consistent with open meeting law requirements. All meeting dates, times, and genders are posted in advance, and we invite public comment during our meetings. Uh, however, we ask the public to limit their comments to issues that are within our purview. Today's agenda includes a request for determination of applicability to determine if building demolition and related site work uh, is a subject to the Wetlands Act or the Wetlands Ordinance. Uh, that on Burt's Pit Road, uh, then a notice of intent pursuant to the wetlands ordinance uh, and a request for an amendment to a DEP file for a residential driveway construction. This is a revisiting of a case we reviewed before on West Hampton Road. Then a re request for certificate of compliance on West Hampton Road, a request for partial certificate of compliance on Park Hill Road, uh, and a request to hold neighborhood tag sale at Montview and a request to use conservation properties for activities where a fee is charged uh, and then a review of any mail. Um, so to uh, um, start off, um, to first, are there any, I can't, since I can only see one screen at a time, I can't tell if we have members of the public and if anybody wants to make a comment. If not, um, looking back, uh, were there minutes, Sarah? I, there were not. I'll have uh, two sets for you. Uh, we had a, a lot of uh, attachments, but I don't think there were any minutes. Okay. So we'll go to the first case, request for determination of applicability about uh, building demolition and related site work at uh, Burt's Pit Road. Uh, I know this is a, uh, a, a city initiated um, request. So I don't know who is, uh, is Wayne there? I, I see uh, a shared screen. Yeah, that's Wayne. Yes, hi, I'm here. Um, thank you very much. So um, just some quick history. Um, I think probably only Mason was on the Conservation Commission in, in 1994 when the city went through an entire process of saying if the state hospital is going to be surplus, what land do we want to be preserved and what land should go forward and be developed. Um, what resulted in that is we preserved, um, I think, 400 and some odd acres out of the 500 acre campus, including an agriculture preservation restriction and all the open space on the drumlin and the area near the jail. Um, this parcel, the parcel you see on the screen, that was carved out. So just for context, this is Burt's Pit Road. This is the very westerly edge of the state hospital right here. So if you're going into town, that really sharp curve on, on Burt's Pit Road that goes by the Drumlin, that's about half a mile east of this point. So this parcel of land was isolated. So all this land around it, all the land across the street is permanently protected agricultural land. We kept this parcel out because at the time there was a house on it, which was being used by the Commonwealth as a halfway house for developmentally disabled adults. That's this house right here. That stopped being used sometime in the mid 1990s. Um, our, and we got, or it's the early 1990s. We got legislation through the state, which transferred the entire parcel to the Northampton Housing Authority they're gonna do affordable housing. They came before the Conservation Commission. They did this wetland delineation then, and um, the Conservation Commission allowed these buildings to be torn down and a new large complex of buildings for a halfway house to be built. Housing Authority never got financing and because the deed, the way they acquired it, the land reverted back to the Commonwealth. We just got legislation through last year to transfer that land to the city for affordable housing. And we just took title to the property a few weeks ago. Um, so we're trying to go forward. Our plan is to demolish the house, the garage, and then just the little bit of stuff that's left from some other foundations. This foundation is virtually nothing left. is some concrete and wood. 
Um, but the garage and the house are standing, even though they've been empty for 20 years. They're actually in, you know, not great shape and not horrible shape, but unusable, you know, mold and water leaks and asbestos and all those things. Um, so we've, we've completed the asbestos study um, and our next step is to tear down these structures. And so the request for termination is basically to say within this work area, so the area in red is the area we need to be able to have machinery go so we can tear down the structures. Um, so we're clearly within the buffer zone of the wetlands. The wetlands has not changed substantially, if at all, from the delineation the commission accepted many years ago. Um, we will have to come back to you when we're ready to develop the site. So our, our request now is only for requests for the demolition um, and we'll come back for either request for termination or more likely notice of intent. Our intention is to donate this property to Habitat for Humanity um, with a condition that they put three single family homes on the property or three attached homes, that's up to them. Um, and it will be a fossil fuel free site. That's one of our conditions for transfers. So we would come back later, either we or Habitat, I'm not sure which, would come back later, but they're nowhere close to being designed. So hence only the demo right now. All right. Um, now I'm actually on my computer. I'm going to take a break. So I'll see if anybody has any questions or comments for me. See if anybody has any questions or comments for me. I, I drove by there uh, today and uh, there's quite a few trees on the property. Are they all gonna be cut down? So we have to cut down a, a few trees, probably three or four for the demo. Um, I don't know the answer in terms of the design that, you know, again, Habitat is gonna hire a designer and, and do a proposal. So I'll come before you. Um, we have, zoning that encourages affordable housing, but it, it waives removal of trees of, of only if they have to go before the planning board for site plan approval and show that that would allow net zero energy bill. So yes, some trees will have come back, but I don't really know what those are yet. Um, How it, old is the delineation? Oh, it goes back to 1990 something. Um, the commission yeah. issued a permit, I think, in 2005. Oh, okay. Later than I thought, actually. It'll have to be uh, re reviewed or something before they do any more development on the site. Yes. So we're, you know, in the, in the checkbox, we're only asking you to approve that the work we're doing won't have negative impacts, not asking you to approve the delineation. So when we come back with a new project, yes, absolutely, we do fresh buildings. And Mason, as I noted in my staff report, I did go out in the fall um, just to see if the delineation still made sense and there's no evidence that it's expanded towards the proposed work area in any way. Okay. There is, you can see, it's not like it's steep, but you can see there is sort of a, it's, you don't have contour lines over here, but it's relatively flat or gently sloping and then it gets steep going up to the site. So there is sort of a natural barrier between, you know, that makes it not that likely wetlands would march that far up the hill. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I was, I was concerned about, that's why I asked the question about the tree removal because the demolition of the buildings and substantial tree removal, what would be preventing a uh, runoff from going down that steep hill behind it. So, I mean, they have to be some kind of barrier to protect the resource area. Yeah, I mean, certainly we're happy if you want to put as a condition, you know, that we put an erosion control barrier. I think we're doing it anyway, but we're happy to include that in it. 
would, would that be now or when you come back with a, a plan? We would certainly do it when we came back with a plan. Um, we think the demo is far enough away and stable enough, but if you wanted erosion control barrier, you wouldn't object at all. I just didn't know the, ex the extent of the, of the work on the site. If everything was being leveled, that'd be quite a bit of disruption of the soil. Yes, I mean, we, to be clear, when we've demolished, like we've demolished a couple of buildings within the state hospital Aglands, and there we just took the structure above grade. In this case, we will be ripping out the foundation because we want to clear the site. So, you know, there's no question there is some disturbance to soil when you do a you know, significant disturbance to soil for the house itself. The foundation that's closest to the wetlands, that's really just sort of remnant pieces of concrete. So that cleanup is relatively small. But the foundation itself will be digging down, you know, six feet, whatever deep the foundation is. Any other comments or questions? Okay, if not, a uh, um, motion to close the hearing. Uh, for an RDA, you don't need an official motion. Oh, friendly, sorry, you RDA indeed. Um, given that it's a, a two-step process, I, I don't have any um, concerns because before um, any additional work gets done uh, beyond the red lines uh, or where there might be impact beyond the red lines, um, that it's a... Uh, uh, we get another bite at that apple. So uh, um, looks to me like this is a, uh, a fair thing. One question I had, uh, having worked decades and decades and decades, like 40 plus years ago, uh, having worked at the state hospital, this is one of the last remaining old wood frame buildings that were part of the state hospital complex. Um, are, there, are there any others left besides this one? Um, I don't think so. Um, well, I guess the only one is 91 Grove, the homeless shelter. That uh -huh. was part of the state hospital. The city got that and we transferred to ServiceNet. Um, uh, I think that's the only one that still remains. I'm just trying to think through it. Well, uh, does anybody, I can't see all the people on the commission. I apologize for having to work with my phone for a bit. I thought I was gonna be able to get my computer to work, but then it kicked back out again. So uh, I'm stuck with just phone access. So I can't see everybody. Does anybody have concerns or shall, can I get a motion to uh, approve the uh, staff recommendation, uh, which was uh, uh, negative determination check box three that it will not impact any adjacent resource areas um, and that it is within the buffer zone, um, but uh, will not impact adjacent areas. I'll make a motion to that. And, and a second? Second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor, Sarah, I assume you need a roll call. Correct, yeah. Um, Kevin? Yes. Mason? Yes. Jack? Yes. Jen? Yes. Randy? Yes. And Alec? Yes. All right, unanimous, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Wayne. Take care. Now we got a couple of minutes, Sarah, before it's uh, 10 of. Uh, is there something brief that we can address? I think people were planning to come for all of, actually, if you wanted to do the, the West Hampton Road item, I, I don't believe um, that the applicant was planning to come for that one. That was pretty and straightforward. That, that's the certificate of compliance for, uh, uh, that one's a complete, not a partial, right? Yes. yes. So this, okay. um, 
So the commission issued an order back in 2005 for construction of an addition and there, there weren't detailed plans that went with it. So I didn't have a lot of information to share, uh, but it was noted that it was 30 feet from the edge of BVW. Um, the applicant provided some images and a, an updated plot plan that looked made it look like that's that's about what happened. Um, the order didn't include any specific conditions, just a requirement for an as-built plan. So yep. a full as-built wasn't provided if the commission, could, if they need that, it could be required. Um, but if, it, if you feel like you have enough information, you can move on. So uh, someone want to make a motion to approve the certificate of compliance for 1175 West Hampton Road? So moved. And a second? Second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Sarah? Uh, Kevin? Yes. Mason? Yes. Jack? Yes. Jen? Yes. Randy? Yes. And Alec? Yes. All right, unanimous, thank you. All right. Um, now on to uh, the next case, a notice of intent uh, for residential driveway construction within the buffer zone and wetland areas. This is a revisiting of the case at 1087 West Hampton Road. Someone here to uh, present on that case? I will begin. My name is Tom Miranda. I'm an attorney. I represent Tim Sini in the application. And uh, just by way of a background for uh, the commission, the history of the parcel is such that this was a large parcel of land that um, a family, the Simmons family, that abuts the property on the east, uh, developed into three lots off of a flag lot and then retained a fourth lot, which has about 14 acres. And uh, that's the property that's next to their home. Um, uh, it so happened that they were unable to complete the project and uh, Mr. Sini uh, purchased the land, all four lots from uh, the East Hampton Savings Bank a number of years ago and finished the uh, completion of the three lots off the flag lot. Mm -hmm. They've since been sold and now uh, he is before the commission because he needs to have access to the fourth lot. And he, uh, he had understood that uh, he was going to be able to have access off the common driveway, but that's not permitted by zoning. So even though he had constructed uh, to access lot, this fourth lot off the common driveway, mm -hmm. he's not able to do so. So he has to come up from Route 66, which requires going through a wetland. Uh, about a year ago in May, we came before the commission and uh, uh, presented the information uh, with regard to the notice of intent. And we were granted a order of conditions under the Massachusetts uh, wetland uh, provisions, but it was deemed that the presentation didn't adequately explain how we complied with the Northampton uh, ordinance, <clears throat> part of which was um, the way that we understood the decision of the commission was that we were required to have a stormwater management plan, which we have since developed. Uh, it was originally started by uh, Jim Gracia, who was our previous um, engineer for the project, but due to health reasons, he was he unfortunately just not able to continue. He had family issues. And so um, Mr. Chris Chamberlain has picked up uh, the project, uh, completed the stormwater management plan, and it's been approved and it's been submitted to the commission. When doing this, um, we were had a little bit of a concern that uh, because the stormwater management plan varied slightly from the original uh, engineering that Mr. Gracia had presented, that uh, there might be a need to, or the commission might deem it necessary to amend the order of conditions granted under the uh, Massachusetts regulations. And so we therefore coupled this uh, notice of intent under the Northampton ordinance with a request for a determination whether or not there's a need 
under uh, to amend the uh, the Massachusetts uh, or order of conditions, and we have uh, presented that uh, uh, in tandem uh, to the commission at this point. The notice that went out to the abutters uh, incorporated notice of both the um, notice of intent under the Northampton ordinance and the fact that we were asking for determination as to whether or not there would be a need to amend the order of conditions under the state ordinance and if so to have it all heard at the same time this evening um, and that's sort of the the general background of what we've uh, what we're dealing with and i'm going to turn it over to chris chamberlain who is uh intimate with what uh he did in terms of uh, getting the stormwater management plan why we feel that uh, there is not a need to amend the uh, the state order of conditions and move forward accordingly. Tom, if I could just jump in before Chris gets started. Um, I talked to DEP and they thought, and, and I agreed that it would make a lot more sense if, that if the commission does issue, just to issue it under both so that you don't have two separate orders that, that reference two separate documents. So it, there, you know that can be discussed later when the, the commission gets to it. But it, no matter what the commission would be amending if, if it were issued. Okay, great. Um, that, that's helpful to set that out at the beginning. Um, again, I'm Chris Chamberlain, a professional engineer with Berkshire Design Group. Um, I'm gonna give an overview of the project. Um, Sarah, am I able to share? Should be able to. Let's see, there we go. Um, so to start with, just to um, orient everyone, um, this is West Farms Road and Route 66, and the property that we're talking about is this one right here. Um, as I flip over to an existing conditions plan, which is rotated slightly with uh, West Hampton Road 66 um, shown right here. Um, and I do want to uh, then highlight um, the resource areas that are involved. Um, obviously, there's a lot of slope on this site. Um, the high portion of the site uh, uh, located up in this portion of the property um, and sloping uh, at varying levels of steepness out from there. Um, there are sort of three distinct areas of wetlands uh, that are all BBW within this site. Um, the first one is here down by the road, which I'm tracing with my cursor now. Um, a second one here along this property line, sort of right at the toe of slope of the steep portion of the site, which flattens out to this area, uh, which is a, a relatively open field. And then uh, a third set of BBW up here. Um, and so now this is a view of the proposed plan. Um, the backbone of this site being um, a new uh, single family house, as well as an 875 foot long driveway, um, providing that required access that Tom discussed from Route 66. Um, the horizontal alignment of these components are exactly the same as the last time um, that uh, I wasn't here, but the other folks were here. Um, the grades have changed ever so slightly um, so that we can capture the stormwater in the ways that we need to, to make sure that our stormwater management plan works. Uh, but uh, this uh, hugs close to, an, to the property line of the parcel here and is located outside of the 50 foot buffer of the wetland over here. I do wanna clarify one thing. I think Tom had a slip of the tongue in his introduction. He said that we were required to trail through wetlands to create this uh, driveway. Uh, that's not correct. This is a buffer only project, um, but we are unable to avoid any buffer impacts um, because the only uh, legal route under the zoning into the site is from Route 66, and the entirety of the frontage is located either within the buffer or immediately adjacent to wetlands. And I am going to um, zoom in just a little bit. Um, and so, you know, the driveway and house are, you know, pretty typical construction. Um, the, the buffers are actually, I apologize, the buffers are a little difficult to see on this plan. Um, but this is the wetland line here. 
Mm -hmm. And the 50 foot buffer I'm tracing is this thin line here. So as you can see, our limit of disturbance comes right up to it, um, which has expanded from the previous plan um, entirely because it was necessary in order to provide the stormwater management um, that we uh, submitted. And then the 100 foot buffer I'm also going to trace here. Mm -hmm. And again, we do have a couple of small areas of impact into the very outer edges of the 100 foot buffer in some of these other locations, again, entirely so that we could fit in the grading for our stormwater management. And so I do want to talk a little bit in detail about the stormwater management because that's both what has changed since um, the previous um, uh, Conservation Commission meeting, um, as well as is most significant um, uh, in terms of addressing some of the concerns that were raised last time. Um, overall, this is uh, designed to comply with both the Massachusetts and Northampton stormwater standards. Uh, we were, had uh, back and forth with DPW to ensure that we were meeting those standards 100%. Um, and were issued a stormwater permit by DPW, meaning that we did uh, achieve that goal um, back in March 11th. Um, it's based on natural scale design, um, uh, significant levels of bioretention as well as infiltration where possible as the site conditions allow. Um, some of the components that I'm gonna highlight are that um, on the upper portion of the driveway, we are capturing sheet flow from that driveway with a gravel diaphragm and then entering a number of water quality devices. Working from the top of the site, sort of the front portion of the house, including uh, half the roof, uh, as well as uh, the turnaround area, um, garage, and some of the driveway, enter into a rain garden in this location right here. Um, groundwater conditions don't allow us to have infiltration out of that rain garden. But we do capture the water filter it through the rain garden soils and then under drain it uh, in order to provide water quality. Further down the hill, um, we found soils that were a little bit more amenable, while not ideal, still um, adequate for stormwater infiltration. Uh, also performed uh, infiltration tests to ensure that those would work. And we have two infiltration basins that take the uh, water that is pretreated by that gravel diaphragm and infiltrate to the extent that we can uh, back to groundwater. And these also provide for some peak flow attenuation um, by allowing a place to capture and detain that water. Um, in the very large storms, it would overflow over a stabilized spillway, stabilized with uh, stone and then a sheet flow off toward uh, the buffer areas um, to the uh, south and west. Moving down the site, um, through the steep portion of the site, we are continuing to have um, swales for conveyance uh, that are armored in riprap that it's been designed based on the velocities that we're expecting to see based on our stormwater modeling um, to convey both the water from uphill on the site as well as the uh, driveway runoff separately. The driveway runoff uh, being then untreated at that point is carried into a wet water quality swale in the flatter portion of the site where we're able to slow that water down and allow for settlement of uh, sediment and uptake of nutrients. And then, you know, the real uh, sort of heavy lifter on the stormwater management system is an infiltration basin here down at the bottom of the site. Um, the bottom of the site, uh, as we examine the soils here, has a thick layer of loam over it, but below that we have some really good medium and fine sands. Um, infiltration rates were really good in this location. And so without impacting that 50 foot buffer line, we've maximized the size that we can infiltrate where we have those good soils um, and have pushed uh, the driveway water into that basin, uh, which will infiltrate those soils as a means of uh, peak flow rate attenuation, uh, the water quality being served by both the uh, treatment through the swale and the infiltration, and then of course uh, meeting our recharge goals. Um, and so that is sort of the, the broad overview. Um, as I mentioned, um, this has been submitted to DPW. Um, we're balancing peak flow rates in each of the drainage areas that we have on site. There are sort of three separate watersheds uh, that 
this site is split into, balancing the peak flow in each of those directions as well as from the property as a whole. Um, the stormwater standards require us to treat uh, runoff to 80% removal of average to total suspended solids. Um, our estimate is that we're treating about 91% based on uh, the DEP guidelines. And um, overall, we have a required recharge um, based on the impervious area that we've created of about 800 cubic feet. And we're providing um, storage below overflow on each of these infiltration structures, totaling about 3,500 square feet. So significantly in excess of what we'd be um, obliged to do. Um, and so uh, with that overview, I then just do wanna to touch on um, the uh, performance standards, um, there are sort of two performance standards under the local bylaw uh, that are of concern. Um, the first one um, being the general standard that allows uh, certain work between 50 and 100 foot buffers, um, not to exceed 20% of the total buffer area on the site. Um, I do have a, a plan uh, separately to show it, but uh, in calculating the, the total disturbance in that zone on the site, we are uh, just under 18% of disturbance of that area. And then separate from that, um, the local bylaw does allow the commission to approve uh, limited projects as defined by the state regulations um, as a limited project also under the local bylaw. And in this case, we would qualify for a limited project status because this is access to an upland area uh, which has no alternative but to go through the jurisdictional area. Um, and I think, uh, you know, given the location of this wetlands and the frontage in this location, and the fact that uh, zoning does not allow us to approach this site uh, from the common driveway located up here, uh, this really is the only alternative to, um, uh, to enter the site and access this upland area and the buildable part of the project. Um, and so then I think uh, aside from that, Tom gave a pretty good overview um, about the uh, regulatory requirements that, that we're going over. And so I'm happy to answer any questions on, on the plan. And I don't know if Emily, actually Emily Stockman, our wetland scientist here, I don't know if she had anything to add specifically. What is the offsite structure? It appears to be a drainage structure and is that going to impact the... Um, so this wetland? is an, sorry, go ahead. Just off the site, it, it looks like a uh, some kind of storage area or something. Yes, so the um, common driveway and uh, the development up here, uh, they have a large detention basin uh, that's located in this area that discharges to a level spreader um, toward this site. Uh, we have incorporated um, the site because now, you know, we're obligated to manage the stormwater on our site, but the impact of water coming from uphill obviously is very important. And so in doing the um, stormwater analysis, we've absolutely accounted for the water that's being contributed from this adjacent site through the detention basin. We actually modeled this detention basin as part of our stormwater analysis to ensure that that was incorporated. Okay, that was my concern. Mm -hmm. Other questions from commissioners? You probably addressed this uh, in the last visit, but what's the uh, paving material for the driveway? Um, so it is proposed as a gravel driveway uh, with the option likely to be taken by the uh, homeowner to pave it. Um, the stormwater system is designed considering either of those being the, the surface. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments from commissioners? Is there a planting plan for any trees removed? Um, so we have not prepared a planting plan as part of uh, this project, as part of this uh, presentation. Um, there certainly would be a planting plan with the construction of the house. Um, it would not be going through site plan review, so the tree ordinance wouldn't necessarily apply because um, it's, it's a by right development. 
Well, it's by right, but as I understand it, uh, the demonstration of that there are, are no harmful impacts to any of the interests uh, for which we're responsible, uh, that, that burden of, of evidence falls on the applicant. Um, so that it's by right within certain limits. You, you got to demonstrate that there isn't any harm being done. Understood. Um, yeah, so we have not uh, prepared a planting plan um, uh, for, for the impacts on this portion of the site. Um, Chris, can you comment on the, uh, on the flow of the water that we discussed in terms of uh, where it goes and whether or not there's a greater impact or a lesser impact or any type of an impact down gradient, please? Yeah, so we had a, a lengthy back and forth with DPW about exactly how to model some of the flow onto the site from upstream. Um, and so, as I mentioned, our design is balancing the stormwater in sort of all three directions, as well as from the property as a whole, um, with uh, accounting for what's occurring with the existing stormwater management design um, uh, site and also looking at where the water was flowing in the pre in the true pre-development condition before this uh, property was uh, developed. Um, and so uh, obviously you know, that modeling is very complicated, but it's got a lot of conservative assumptions in it. Um, and so you know, our opinion is that the, the between the peak flow rates and the volume, that, uh, that the stormwater management system is, is appropriately managing flow um, to each of, the, uh, each of the drainage areas uh, consistent with no net increase in runoff, but also um, sort of sending the water where it's supposed to be going. I don't know if that answered the question entirely. Chris, could you talk a little bit about the maintenance that will be needed for the, the stormwater system? Sure. Um, so the natural scale sort of stormwater systems, the maintenance is not onerous, but it's very important. Um, it is for the most part um, keeping up with inspections of making sure that you're not seeing signs of erosion, making sure that uh, the plants that, that are growing there are healthy, that it's not being overrun with invasives, of course. Um, and then particularly with the infiltration devices, um, ensuring that after a, a heavy rain that they are emptying the way they are supposed to by soaking into the ground. Um, so as part of our stormwater permit, there's a operation and maintenance agreement that will ultimately have to be signed with the city, um, ensuring that that maintenance is done. Um, it includes uh, all of those inspections. And then to the extent that there are any issues uh, identified through the inspections, um, uh, uh, going through and, and making repairs, which are sort of typical landscaping repairs for the most part, um, but also you know, making sure the integrity of the edge of some of these basins uh, is maintained. And that report actually does have to be submitted to the city annually. And is that a condition that's uh, now attached to the deed or referred to in the deed? How is that in any subsequent ownership uh, going to be followed? That, yeah, that so the stormwater permit has a condition that before construction starts, that agreement with the city must be executed and then recorded on the deed. And recorded, okay. Yeah, so it is not at this point, but it must be before uh, construction. Before work. Okay. Chris, I, this is Emily Stockman, excuse me, um, Kevin, through the chair, if I may. I was hoping I could just interject a little bit about the concept of a planting plan that was mentioned by one of the commissioners. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. So um, the amendment that you see before you this evening really focuses on the concerns that were uh, voiced by the commission during the last public hearing. And that focus was on site stability, uh, stormwater management and ensuring that there would be no issues with erosion and sediment that would impact the wetlands adversely. The commission um, may recall that at the in initial hearing about a year ago, we also didn't have defined plans for a proposed house. 
and um, living space associated with that. So with the plan before you, Chris has been able um, to work through the entire process, um, not just the process within the commission's jurisdiction, but went above and beyond outside of jurisdiction um, to make sure that you were provided with a complete picture of the project, not just the driveway. And in doing so, the real goal here was to um, address buffer zone impacts, which are protected as jurisdictional areas under the state regs, but also as resource areas under the ordinance. The best way to protect is to preserve. So first and foremost, most of the siting uphill is located not just outside of that inner 50, but outside of the complete 100 foot buffer zone. It's only as we approach the frontage that unfortunately we cannot um, avoid that impact starting from the 50 foot boundary with some of the limit of work and moving um, away from it. With that said, the remaining buffer zone is a mix of forest with uh, shrub canopy, um, a number of uh, berry producing wildlife shrubs are gonna be preserved. And to do any additional planting within the actual limit of work um, would be counter <laughs> to the excellent design that Chris is presenting um, before you now. So we certainly could look at incorporating some native plantings um, in some aspects of the area, but the design is really focused on using um, low impact development concepts and environmentally sensitive design to break up those stormwater points into smaller catch basins, encourage natural sheet flow, and encourage infiltration. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments from commissioners? I guess one question that, that I have as I uh, look at the revised plan is um, in the creation of these infiltration basins and, and detention areas uh, and so forth, all these stormwater control um, uh, areas in the existing terrain, how much removal of existing uh, foliage, uh, the existing um, uh, plants of all kinds, I imagine this was what was behind um, Mason's question. Uh, how much is going to be disturbed or removed in the process of creating these swales and so forth? So I, I can speak to that as far as the buffer zone impacts go to as a percentage. Um, the ordinance says that the impact should be um, less than 20% right. in that zone and we were able to um, keep it under 18% of that right. overall buffer zone. Right, no, I, I remember Chris saying that, that's right, thank you. Yeah, and I, I will say that, you know, all of the structures in this portion of the site are built outside of the buffer. Again, there were two locations that we couldn't avoid um, in order to uh, make these large enough to capture the volume necessary to provide the water quality. So of course, that's always a balance that we're that we're trying to strike. Um, but you know, the the upper portion of the site where it's possible to stay out of out of the buffer, that's what we've done with uh, with these areas that we would create. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, I can't tell whether there's any members of the public who might have a question or comment, but I'll open it for that first. I have a couple questions. Yes, who's this? Hi, this is Cassidy Bowman. Uh, I uh, live in property abutting uh, this property to the east. Uh, and just just to clarify, I, I, I want to clarify, it's a little hard to um, envision on Zoom, 
but the questions from the public during an, uh, a public hearing are always addressed to the commission, not to the applicant. Um, sure. the, the applicant may in fact then respond um, uh, through the, the commission, but this is, uh, we want, always want to avoid a debate between or, or uh, interchange directly between an applicant and members of the public. That's just how open meeting law requires us to conduct things. Understood. Uh, so first question to the commission is, uh, is the applicant building this house or is the applicant building this driveway or is this just a plan to do this and then sell the property? That's not within our purview. I can, uh, okay. do, uh, this is a, a plan being presented for a specific driveway that indicates the building uh, intent, but uh, our who owns and, and uh, uh, what the future plan for ownership is, is not something that's within the purview of the commission. So let me rephrase uh, to the commission. Uh, is it possible that this land could be sold and somebody could build a house in a completely different location? Uh, no, if we are permitting this, that would require a whole different notice of intent if they're gonna change the plan. Got it. All right. Um, and then do you mind if I share my screen for 15 seconds? Um, if that's, Sarah, is that, can participants do that? I don't know whether something technically is necessary in order to allow that. I can probably just press. Uh, if, if it's agreeable with the commission, it is technically possible. Yeah. Okay, sure, go ahead. So uh, let's see here. Let's see, how can I do this? Screen, I don't know, oh, sorry. Let me know if you can see these pictures. Yep, it's up. All right, so I took this picture two days ago in my driveway. These are over 100 foot pine, three of them uprooted um, because they're in a swamp. Uh, let me, that's, that, that's my driveway. You can see the three that are leaning right there. So the only reason these are uprooted is because somebody came along and thought that they had a better idea of how they could send water. And uh, these pine trees didn't grow that high growing in, in a swamp, which they're in now. I can unshare now or I can. So I, look, I'm a layman here. My understanding of all this is based on sitting through the last meeting and sitting through this one and reading through the plans. The last meeting was, we want, you know, in a nutshell, we want to go within the barrier, within the boundaries of the wetlands, and then they didn't really do the burden of proof, and that would seem to be an easy no for you. This plan seems to be like, we want to go within the boundaries, and we're going to do a whole mess of man-made stuff because we know better. And I guess if you've been to this property and you've looked around, there's trees falling down everywhere because somebody thought they knew better. And... That's all I really had to say. It's, it's, there's trees, just hundred foot trees just falling down everywhere because the water is coming straight down into that, into this basin. That's all I got. Okay, thank you. May I, may I say something, a comment on that, please? Sure, certainly. Yes, uh, between 1991 and uh, 2002, I was trustee of a trust and a client of mine, we were working together on this and we owned the property that is now owned by Mr. Cassidy and there, there was no butter on the other side. And I went out there because I was considering purchasing it to build on it. And in the springtime, there were at least a foot, foot and a half of water uh, before, if you look at where the, if you're familiar with the property, where the dr common drive comes in and separates, prior to that, it was impassable. I mean, in the springtime, there was always water there. And I went out there one time that I recall, I don't know if I did it more than once, uh, after a series of uh, rainstorms. And again, this was all underwater. And this was before it was developed. And I decided I wasn't interested in the property. So 
just as a historically, from my personal knowledge, where Mr. Cassidy's property, I believe his home is obviously beyond where the water was, but that area uh, was always inundated with water in the springtime and after heavy rains. Thank you. Um, what we have to evaluate the plan uh, based on what's presented before us uh, and uh, speculation about what consequences of other people's plans at other times might have had uh, can't really be part of our consideration. Uh, so that's, uh, we, we are limited to, to assess what's being presented before us right now. Um, we do take into account um, uh, some caution around how um, effectively uh, human intervention can uh, coexist with uh, successful wetlands. Um, uh, that's a lot of what the, both the state uh, act and the city ordinance are all about, um, but those are our tools and we have to use them to make those kinds of assessments. Any other questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, Kevin, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, Lynn Simmons has a, a hand raised. Uh, no, I couldn't see that, please. Hi, thank you. Um, and first, I do want to thank the applicant. Um, I definitely can see from these plans here tonight that he took the concerns that we raised at the last meeting and really went back and um, addressed some of them. And or certainly, um, I feel like some of what we were we brought up at the last meeting he did um, try to address. Um, I do have two questions, if I may, through the chair. Um, one, uh, there was a statement made uh, by Chris that grades changed slightly to capture stormwater. So I wondered if he could just maybe elaborate on that. I'm guessing it's driveway grades and like what that would look like for us as the direct abutter. Um. Uh, I, I had been assuming that this was in order to, cr to create uh, more level um, circumference around the detention areas. But Chris, why don't you uh, explain whether my assumption was correct? Um, sure, uh, that is correct. Um, but uh, that comment was specifically referring to the driveway um, and it's really changes in the cross slope of the driveway so that we can separate the runoff from the driveway onto its own swale so that we can run that through the treatment devices and make sure that we improve the water quality of it without dumping all of the uh, clean water coming from uphill into that and then necessitating a much larger structure to capture that volume. Um, so that's, that's specifically what that meant. Uh, certainly in creating these infiltration basins and rain gardens and such, it was necessary to expand the footprint of the grading as you see. Um, but uh, aside from, from those tweaks in the driveway to ensure that we're catching the water we need to, um, the grades in the driveway are unchanged. Um, hey, I, uh, I do have a few more questions if, if you would entertain it. Um, please. Uh, so the um, stormwater um, management plan and, and what's in front of us tonight here, was that developed based on the maximum area to be cleared and the max and the size of the footprint of the house? Like was that, is, is what's um, being presented tonight going to capture the full extent of what we could expect to be cleared and for impervious area? I think that's the, uh, the set of assumptions that goes into creating um, this a stormwater plan. So I, th I, I think the answer would have to be yes or it would not be uh, uh, an, an adequately professional plan. Um, I, I would agree with that. We've defined a limit of disturbance on the plan. If that limit of disturbance were to change, we would need to resubmit and submit a new stormwater or a revised stormwater plan to DPW under our stormwater permit. And if the limit of disturbance within the buffer changed at all, um, certainly we'd have to come back to the Conservation Commission. And we've made an assumption of a house size that, that captures essentially uh, virtually any home that would be built on that, um, in that location. DPW's stormwater review process is based on, on an area of disturbance. Any project that alters an, an acre or more has to go through that. And that's actually stricter 
than the State Wetlands Protection Act. So this, this stormwater actually isn't under the commission's purview. Um, this is exempt as a single family home. So the, the city's additional permit process is a, a little stricter than the state in this case, which is a good thing. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and I just, just my last statement, um, and it's kind of in reference to something someone stated when um, giving the opening here. Um, just the, the impact um, already is more um, on the adjacent area. It already exists be, with, with the land as it sits right now. So the impact that was done um, further up the grade there is already impacting both myself, the neighbor next to us who couldn't be here tonight and um, Cassidy. Um, so I just, I feel strongly that further adding a uh, wetlands disturbance and impervious area is only gonna create more of an impact no matter what type of system we try to design. And um, I just I just wanted to end with that. I, I don't see how this is going to put us in any better situation than um, we already are right now. It's not great now and I don't see how this is gonna make it any better. Thank you. Um, Miss, if I may, through the chair, this was a point of discussion during the last public hearing. Mm -hmm. And um, at the request of the commission, as we were delving into these revisions, we did take a greater look at the neighborhood. I believe that Chris has, through his share screen, some aerial images um, that we could discuss as far as overall watershed impacts. Through the DPW process, as well as the CONCOM process, Chris has um, completed the required modeling for impacts on the applicant's parcel. Um, and he has obtained a, a stormwater permit. But as we looked at the satellite images, um, this one starting in 2001, Chris can sort of show you the forested, excuse me? This one's 2011. Oh, sorry, 2011. Um, I believe you can see the forested area that is at least in part, part of the subject parcel, as well as the neighborhood that's developed to the east. And if we continue down the timeline, what we'll see is um, changes not only seasonal, sometimes we have leaf on, sometimes we have leaf off, um, but we have some expansion to the east of the subject property um, where there has been um, some tree clearing and some grading. I can't speak to what the terrain looks like on this property per se, but I can say that the wetlands that were delineated for the current project go right up to that property line. So in that uh, easterly section. And so it looks like from the aerial image that at minimum we have some tree clearing and grading within the associated buffer zone of the bordering vegetated wetland on the subject parcel, which abuts the neighboring property. And just to give the commission a sense of how clearing can impact water tables and hydrology, we've been talking about that a lot this evening and how important it is to be sensitive to that. Um, it's not uncommon that our forested swamps have a hydrology where we have saturation. During the wettest part of the seasons, we may see some pit topography holding water, but for most of the growing season, what we see is that it's fairly terra firma, but the water table is within 12 inches and therefore it's a protected wetland. If one is to go through and remove those mature trees from the wetland in that area, you would have a swing in the hydrology. And instead of having saturation, you could have prolonged inundation. For example, according to the USDS, a single large oak tree transpires about 40,000 gallons of water out of the soil a year. And that's just cutting one tree out of a wetland 
how that could impact the dynamic. So again, we can't delve into a watershed study on other people's property. Chris has done an excellent job doing on-site soil exploration, defining a limit of work, utilizing environmentally sensitive design on-site for the current applicant. But I think it is important that the commission be aware that there are other impacts to this watershed that are occurring outside of the applicant's property. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any uh, last questions from commissioners? Sarah, anything you wanna add before we close the hearing? Uh, and beyond what's in my staff report, I I don't think so. Just to um, a reminder to the commission to make sure that all of the applicable performance standards are met. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not on video. I'm having really yeah. shifty internet issues at the moment. All right. So Kevin, I do have a clarifying question. This is Jen. Hi, Jen. Um, just to, for my understanding, because I wasn't on the commission last year when we reviewed this, but has there been any grading or tree removal or work on the subject property to date? Uh, there was a logging operation that was done at some point. Okay. Um, I, don't, I don't know exactly when that yep. occurred, uh, but, but that's an exempt activity under the Wellness Protection Act. Yep. Okay, thank you. Speak to that, Jen. This is Tim Sini. I'm the owner of the property. Uh, it was logged. At the last meeting we were talking about, it was logged for a view on the three parcels to the west. And I misspoke and I was corrected by Ms. Simmons that yes, some logging was done on the 19 acres that we're talking about now. That logging was done to clear a space for removal of other trees, which is pretty much precisely where the house is going on that drawing you see now. So there's less trees there right now because heads, as I would put it, were brought down there. So they were not left on the hillside. That's a typical logging thing, I guess. And also some mature pines were taken for payment over by Cassidy's property between the two wetlands, not in the wetlands. And there's a, there's a knoll there that he took mature pines off of those. That's all that was logged on that property. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions before we close the hearing? If not, uh, someone want to make a motion to close? Moved. And a second? Second. Uh, and if any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Sarah? Kevin? Yes. Mason? Yes. Jack? Yes. Jen? Yes. Randy? Yes. And Alec? Yes. All right, hearing is closed. Thank you. Um, so uh, a couple of you are more deeply expert about stormwater management than I. Uh, uh, Mason, in, for sure, is usually the person I uh, uh, turn to with questions for, about this kind of thing. Um, and as Sarah said, the, it's, it, it, the, the stormwater plan itself is not within our purview. It's the, uh, uh, the effectiveness of it in preventing harm to a, a, a jurisdictional area that is within our purview. Um, so I'll, I'll open first before we start talking and making a motion. Uh, what are your thoughts, those of you who uh, have a, a deeper professional expertise and are looking at this plan. What I liked was that they they headed off a lot of the uh, uh, downhill con water flow concerns um, actually out of the buffer zone. Granted, a lot of it's within the uh, just just outside buffer zone, but um, quite a bit of it as far as the hill. 
addressed before it got down to where it was going to be a problem. Yeah. So I'm, I'm pleased with that. Other commissioners, thoughts? My own sense is that uh, there's, this is a, um, I don't know if heroic is the right word, but this is a, uh, an, a, an above average effort uh, to um, find a way to make things uh, um, satisfy the requirements of not uh, harming or worsening the situation um, in a jurisdictional area. Um, and for that, I agree with, with Mason that uh, uh, it, it deserves credit. Uh, my own sense is that um, while we can't look beyond um, the subject area about which this plan is, is, is trying to address, um, that within this, this seems like a, uh, a, a defensible approach, a permittable approach. Um, but uh, that's, I'm, I'm uh, as I say, I'm, I'm one of the people on the commission who does not have a professional expertise in this. I'm looking at the rules that we have to operate by. I'm looking at the uh, facts mm -hmm. as presented. I'm looking at uh, kind of common sense uh, interpretations of things. Um, so there may be those of you who have more professional um, expertise who have something else, uh, some other perspective. Uh, that's different. But from my perspective, this looks like the applicant is satisfying the requirements of, to enable us to um, grant a, uh, a, a, an order of conditions um, based on the rules that we have to follow. But like I say, what do other people think? Go ahead, Mason. Well, uh, I think because it went through the stormwater permitting process, I don't believe it had before. And it's stricter uh, permitting process actually than a year ago. Satisfies me that need the stormwater concerns are addressed. Yeah, that was that's the main mm -hmm. concern I had for the whole project to begin with was how the stormwater was. Going. And and I'm I'm glad that the. Uh, Stormwater pro, uh, plans have to be uh, updated every year and the structures have to be maintained because it's great to have this, these drawn on paper, but if they're not, the structures aren't maintained, then uh, the results will be less than desirable. So I'm glad that- And the, the fact that it'd be recorded with the deed uh, that this has to, this operating management plan has to be sustained over time, uh, was reassuring to me because uh, I'm always worried about a subsequent owner um, being bound by uh, the things that we permit. The commission's order should, should you issue one, should definitely require that all of the reporting that um, will be done to DPW should also be provided to the commission. So we have a check yeah. and balance there. Great, great. Any other comments, questions from commissioners? Any other insights, any, any um, alternative ways of looking at this other than what uh, I and Mason have, have expressed and, and Jack? No, I, I think you sort of hit the nail on the head. It's, it's a good plan for a bad situation. Um, right. that, that when you look, and I, I was doing my own <clears throat> look at Google Earth when you were showing those images of the properties to the to the east and looking at the properties to the left and to the west and, and I mean there's a huge amount of clearing um, right. up and uh, what, what I like about the plan is that it is designed to sort of prevent sheeting and water flow across and out the property it, it's designed to capture even some uphill water not just the the drive water that it uh, would be required yeah I appreciated that the uh, little structure up uh, up slope and the adjacent property was accounted for 
as well as just taking the neighborhood approach, thinking about larger impacts aside from just immediately right there on the driveway. So that was um, another positive thing that I noticed with the design. Okay. Uh, so before uh, I ask for a motion uh, to grant an order of conditions, is there any uh, commissioner who has a uh, contrary view that there's a, a, a worry that we should be paying more attention to um, than has been uh, introduced so far? If not, uh, someone want to make a motion to a uh, granted order of condition with standard conditions, uh, uh, plus Sarah uh, 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 indicated that the DPW reports should also regularly go to uh, uh, the commission so that we can monitor things that may not be, uh, may, may not rise to uh, a, a problem uh, by uh, the DPW, but that would be for, if we knew about it. So that would be one additional condition. Sarah, any other special conditions besides standard conditions? Uh, I, as I noted in the staff report, I'd suggest um, a permanent condition requiring that the, the well and resource areas and buffer zones shall remain in a natural and undisturbed state uh, and a specific plan to prevent, prevent alteration to wetlands areas during construction. Um, and, and I oh, that's right. I, just, sorry, I haven't no, read the, the rest of, of that the order. Yep. Um, so when someone does make a motion, it, it should be to issue under the, the local ordinance and also issue an amended order pursuant to the State Wetlands Protection Act, just for clarity. Right, so, so we're going, back, going back to what we would usually do, which is to grant an order of condition under both. All right, someone want to make a motion to that effect? Make a motion to that effect. And a second. Second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor, Sarah? Kevin? Yes. Mason? Yes. Jack? Yes. Jen? Yes. Randy? Yes. And Alec? Yes. Very unanimous, thank you. All right. Very good. Um, now we have uh, a uh, partial request for a partial certificate of compliance. Uh, it's the solar array on Park Hill Road. Um, we talked, your, your report covered it, Sarah, but you want to um, summarize why this is only partial? The uh, the applicant is is here. Devin, did you oh. want to oh, good. speak to this? Sure. I, I look pretty pretty interesting right now. The sun's hitting me through the shade, so I apologize. <laughs> uh, Yipes. Yipes. Um, <laughs> so the uh, project has been complete since about I'd say October of last year. Um, at which time the site was fully stabilized. Um, the, the site, if the commission remembers, is a uh, old farm field. So it, it really after construction had finished that the vegetation really sprung back up. I was surprised. It, I, I left the site, came back about a month later, and it was just completely stabilized from dirt um, in some certain areas a month previously. So the completed work includes the installation of the uh, uh, solar array, uh, construct, construction of equipment pads, um, as well as the um, required electrical equipment, um, all the, the fencing, signage, roadways, um, as well as uh, we had constructed a riprap um, drainage trench along the side of the gravel road, which was one of the um, ass of the DPW department um, when we were working through permitting with them for the stormwater permit. Um, one thing that did change from when we were approved for the order of conditions was uh, if the commission remembers, we had constructed a, a wide roadway along Park Hill Road. Um, it was gonna involve uh, construction of swales along both sides of the roadway 
Um, it, it would have required a lot of cutting of trees. And it just at the end of the day, we, we felt it was not necessary uh, to install all that infrastructure um, if, if we didn't need to. Um, a lot of those trees were, were very old, very large in diameter. So we actually, we pulled back all those swales. Um, we actually removed the swales in their entirety and created just a, a natural swale from the edge of the uh, improved Park Hill Road that uh, conveys water from the site. Um, it just resulted in a lot less disturbance within the, uh, um, the wetland buffer zones um, and just made sure we didn't have any impacts to the wetland during construction. Um, one thing that we are not requesting a certificate of compliance for, which is the only thing we're not requesting a certificate of compliance for, is the planting of 169 trees. Um, those trees have been planted. Um, they were planted sometime in the early fall, late um, summertime last year. Um, one of the conditions uh, of the order of the uh, order of conditions was that uh, those trees have to survive for three planting seasons, at which time we will provide uh, a report to the commission um, and replant any trees that have died. Um, I'll, I'll take a little bit of thunder from Sarah. Um, she had gone out there the other day and informed me that there's a bittersweet growing up the saplings. Um, I explained to Sarah that we had worked on a project recently in uh, East Hampton and the site is just completely overridden with, with bittersweet. So I'll, uh, I've, we'll be sure to let the uh, client know about those to make sure that they don't really take over those saplings. Um, other than that, uh, happy to answer any questions the commission may have. Any questions from commissioners? Seems like we're just pending um, the three year mark of a healthy set of plantings in order for a, a complete and final order uh, a certificate of compliance. But for now, a, a partial to show that the work has been done and we're just waiting for that time frame is, uh, uh, and that review of the, the plantings, um, which can't be done for three years. Um, so it seems pretty straightforward. Any, any questions or comments? If not, uh, Sarah, we need a vote on this, I assume. Yes, we do. So we, first, um, uh, someone want to make a motion to grant a partial certificate of compliance? I'll make the motion. And a second? Second. Further discussion? If not, uh, all in favor, Sarah? Kevin? Yes. Mason? Yes. Jack? Yes. Jen? Yes. Randy? Yes. Yes. And Alec? Right. Yes. Unanimous, thank you. Very good, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I was just wondering if Sarah, you could provide us with a letter just stating that the only thing that we haven't been granted a uh, certificate of compliance for is the planting of those trees. Yes, will do. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Good enough. Uh, and we've already done the other certificate of compliance. So we now have uh, the uh, Montview folks want to hold a tag sale. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> Hi. Hey, Mac. How you doing? Hey, you doing? I, yes. If, if uh, I'm Mac Everett, I'm, uh, shall I go ahead? Sure, please. Okay. So I'm on the board of the Meadow City Conservation Coalition, and we hold the conservation restriction for the Meadow, uh, Meadows Conservation Area. And part of that property, if you're not familiar with it, is about a half an acre of a grassy field that we refer to as the play field. And it's a place where neighbors and community members gather informally to play soccer or wiffle ball or throw a frisbee or just meet and hang out. Um, and we have had a request from Kokoro Bensonoff, who I think is is on. Hi. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, 
There's, there she is. And she's been talking to some neighbors uh, with the idea of having a community tag sale. And she approached me as an MC3 board member. Um, and then I chatted, checked in with the MC3 board and we thought uh, we would check in with you and find out if it was okay. Uh, I also called the board of health and asked whether uh, what protocols they would consider would be appropriate for an outdoor tag sale. And they said they were okay with it as long as the protocols currently in place for farmers market, uh, farmers outdoor farmers markets are adhered to. And that involves sanitizing and certain distance between vendors and a certain number of people allowed into the tag sale or farmer's market area and so forth. Um, so I forwarded all that to, to Kokoro and, um, and then we checked in with Sarah and she said, we should indeed check with you all to see if it's okay with you. I'm, uh, there, has been, uh, act, there have been activities like this in the past. The Ward 3 Neighborhood Association mm -hmm. has had an annual meeting there and um, and a tag sale in connection with that and everything went well. The, the, there was no problem with any degradation of the property. Uh, people were responsible about cleaning up after themselves. So the MC3 board is pretty comfortable with the idea uh, of having a, a community tag sale there. Although I have to say that I suggested it not, there not be a huge publicity effort just because of COVID <laughs> and uh, the potential for a, a large, a larger crowd. So that's, that's what we're here to talk about. And Kokoro, you might want to add something to what I've said. Hi, um, I live across the street from the field and, um, I was looking at the field thinking it would be nice to have tax sale over there and not instead of uh, the driveway of our house, which is not that accessible to a lot of people. And um, I've talked to few neighbors who are also interested in doing tank sale. So uh, it will be great opportunity to uh, do this um, so that we can do spring purge and also uh, give a opportunity for the neighbors to come together and interact that. The, uh, uh, a few decades ago, I, I lived on Massasoit Street here in Northampton and they had an, the whole neighborhood had an annual tag sale, uh, which was quite a nice event. Parking and traffic were problematic though. And I wonder what thought has been given to managing parking and traffic. Um, I was thinking that I will probably reach out, not probably, I plan to reach out to just the neighbors of this um, around, uh, I guess, Ward 3. Uh, neighbors um and so given the fact that you know we all live closely that um i can suggest that they they can bring the stuff with the, their cars and then pa park their cars on their driveway and then walking back to attend the um the event so that the 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 streets are clear for people who drive past by the park. I hope yeah, I, I would I would add to that that there's uh, quite a bit of on street parking here and we're far enough from downtown that when we've had events like this in the past, um, it hasn't been a problem. Um, and we I think it would be a good idea certainly to encourage people who are not necessarily sellers but people coming to look and maybe buy to walk and ride their bicycles uh, mm. to the event yeah Do commissioners have any 
Uh, thoughts about that? My, my own sense is that if our uh, partner, in this case, MC3, uh, feels okay about it, um, then uh, there isn't anything I can think of it, that would cause the commission to say no. Uh, this is presuming that, as Mac has said, uh, that previous experience with this kind of event has shown no degradation of the conservation area. Have, have we done this before? Is there history uh, here? I, I don't recall an issue like this coming before us before this. So we had an, an agreement with uh, MC3 that, that's now expired. Um, and Mac, we should talk about getting a new one at some point. But um, that allowed for certain types of activities during the life of that agreement. So the, the board meetings and some other things that were held at that point during that time, didn't need approval by the commission. Any other uh, questions or comments? No, I, I just agree with you, Kevin, that, uh, yeah, as long as the holder of the con conservation restrictions comfortable with it and has done similar things in the past, I don't have any concerns. Going to be any kind of cleanup problem after the event is over? I, I think we would make it very clear to, to vendors and so forth that uh, anything that they bring, they need to take away if it hasn't been sold. And that, that's what we did the last time when the Ward 3 Association had uh, a sale there and it there was no problem. People were good about it. And I would certainly be around to just <laughs> keep half an eye on all that to make sure that was going well. Yeah, I'll make sure as well. So, Sarah, do we need a, a vote on this or just a sense of the meeting? Uh, a vote would be great. Then uh, how about a, I, I make a chair motion to uh, uh, agree to uh, um, allow the uh, MC3 uh, organization to oversee and permit um, a tag sale in this case. I don't know if we want to make it a, a blanket thing, but at least for this case, uh, um, seems like a, a reasonable request. So I'll make that as a chair's motion. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor? And I guess another roll call, Sarah. Kevin? Yes. Mason? Yes. Jack? Yes. Jen? Yes. Randy? Yes. And Alec? Yes. All right, unanimous, thank you. And um, now we have a, 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 a similar but different um, that uh, the request to use the conservation area when by an organization is gonna charge a fee. Um, and I haven't read it yet, but I just saw that it I got an email from Bob Zimmerman um, uh, about uh, the Fitzgerald Lake area that they have traditionally discouraged. And so this is a different um, partner holding a conservation, uh, conservation restriction that discourages four fee uh, activities uh, on the uh, conservation area for which they're responsible. Um, well, Sarah, can you say more about this this request? Uh, so there, there's actually someone here to discuss it, um, but I would just point the commission to the the requirements in the the staff report. So you you know this is totally up to you if you find it appropriate. If you don't find it appropriate, but if it is approved, then then staff would absolutely require these these four items in addition to anything else that that you might add. Someone here from the uh, making the request? Yes, hi, good evening. My name is Brian Pearson. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Great. Well, thanks for your time. I am the founder and president of a company called Adventure East. I'm a resident of Hadley. I've lived here eight years, and our company is based, our headquarters are based uh, on Route 116 in Sunderland to be uh, central to the Connecticut River canoe launch there. Um, I'm happy to give more background about the company and our plans overall. 
Um, but at this point, we're requesting permission for the Sawmill Hills to run activities there. I've re reviewed the requirements with Sarah and we're able to comply with those requirements in terms of uh, notification and the fees being charged and um, are seeking permission to proceed with those activities. And if you'd like, I can provide a presentation. Um, it's, it's up to you. I have, I have more information for background if you'd like. Uh, you, can you describe a little what the activity would actually be, how long it would be, et cetera? Sure. So for this specific activity that's published on our website, it would be a two-hour hike with a naturalist guide, John Bodie. He used to be the chair of the, the Conservation Commission, I believe. And he would be guiding a group up to 15 people to show the vernal pools um, and the activity that's happening right now. Thank you. You're welcome. So commissioners, what do you think? So this wouldn't exclude uh, other members of the public from using the area. They're not requiring exclusive use of the area. It's just the group that's going in there. Is that correct? Correct. And just to clarify, oh yeah, just to clarify, are we agreeing to this one hike or are we agreeing to an ongoing use of that property? What's the request? Is, I, is it just for a single time? Well, um, I mean, in the interest of efficiency as a company, it would be nice to develop a relationship with your organization where we were able to uh, provide notification as required by your regulations when we were holding an event um, with the information published according to your uh, requirements. And that would prevent the need to, to come before the commission each time. Uh, we are planning to have a a long-term operation. I don't mean long-term in the sense that we'll be going to your open space regularly. We're working with the entire Connecticut River Valley and we have permission from the Pelham uh, Conservation Commission and we'll continue to work with, we're working with the trustees of the reservation. We're working with Kestrel. We're working with um, many communities. And so this is a process that I'm, you know, uh, I, I enjoy seeking permission and meeting the public, but if we had to do it every time, it would be a full-time job, um, but I'm open to the requirements of the, the commission. I guess I just asked Sarah, because I saw in your report the that one of the requirements um, that you proposed we add was just to check with us before each or to let to give us an announcement before each event, but um, I didn't know if that was a permission or just notice. Um, yeah, I, mean, I was kind of anticipating the the discussion of is this one or or is this yeah. a, a blanket uh, approval of these types of things would come up. Uh, so the bullet point two, where we must be notified before each such tour, I would we were thinking that would be a staff notification. Okay. Yeah. Sarah, could you go over bullet point three? Yes, so it, um, the city is protected by the recreation liability statute. Uh, if, if somebody, you know, if somebody falls and hurts themselves or if something happens to them, the city is not liable. Um, if we started charging for access to conservation areas, that would go away. So as long as it's clear that any time that the fee is, is mentioned by Adventure East, that the fee is, is for their services and, and for their guide, and it's not for access to, the, to Northampton's open spaces, that protects our liability under the, the statute. I, I should say that I am of the mind and in, in various situations where this kind of thing has come up, including whether newly acquired parcels of conservation areas should be uh, open to the public and uh, in what way, that part of how I see our responsibility along with uh, protecting the aid interests uh, defined in the Wetlands Protection Act is also to help uh, the 
population of Northampton um, become more aware of, comfortable with, informed about, educated about um, natural uh, environment. And therefore to get out into conservation areas is, by the public is a good thing from my perspective. And so um, ways of organizing that um, so that they're actually educational efforts, I, I tend to be um, supportive of. Um, I guess my proposal would be, um, let's say that, uh, yes, this is a, a fine thing. Uh, let's ask uh, the applicant to uh, come back after the first one, um, not come back, to, to report after the first one, a summary of what happened, how many people, how much time, what was covered, um, and on the basis of that, assuming that um, that all looks and feels like something the commission is comfortable with, then we could move to a more blanket uh, permission that would require staff notification, as Sarah was just saying. Um, so I guess that's the proposal that I would make. It's a little short of saying, okay, blanket um, permission right now, starting, starting now, and say, let's do it as a two-step. Uh, let's get a report back about how the first one goes, and in all likelihood, we will then, um, uh, it, without you having to come before us, just send a report, and at a future meeting, we would then say, okay, good, went well, Here's we understand it, it's a kind of thing we'd like to support, so sure, just let Sarah know each time you want to do it, but we, we, we do that in a sort of two-step way. What do you think about that, Commissioner? Maybe Maybe at that time we could then put these into the land use regulations, or wouldn't uh -huh. it be appropriate to do that? Uh, I I still think that the commission's approval of these types of activities should be required. You know, if you want to give approval to Adventure yeah. East following this initial um, hike, then that's fine. But if somebody else wants to come in with a with a for profit hike, that doesn't necessarily mean that that would be an appropriate use. That, that should still be in there. Yeah, once, once we build it into land use regulation, then it's uh, uh, it's it's sort of open open season. So I think that may be um, a separate step. No, Kevin, I, I think that that would work well. What you propose, I think it's the I agree with you. As long as the activity is very consistent with the intent of what we hold conservation lands for, which is you know the education and enjoyment, then. I, I'm comfortable with that. And I think having a, a two-step process means that, well, you know, just looking at the website, it's very likely that the, it will go well. And, and yeah, right. But um, I assume so too. But it'd be nice to just check in. So, right. Jen, you were going to say something? Yeah, I agree. And I like that. That's sort of what I was thinking too, is just a two-step, just to get to know what they're doing. And, and I guess I would propose perhaps before we issue the blanket permission next time after hearing about the first event that we just maybe put a cap on participants per uh -huh. visit and over a certain cap we just ask for permission for explicit permission yeah. uh, so that it's not just a blanket bring 200 people not that that's what you all are going to do but <laughs> just that we have some sort of um catch for you know yeah that we'd we don't, well, we don't end up with an entire UMass dormitory deciding to have a party on uh, conservation. Yeah, or, that yeah, if, yeah. or that if we do, we've agreed <laughs> to it explicitly <laughs> and not just in this context, thinking about a 50 person educational hike. So, okay. which sounds great. So, Sarah, then uh, once again, uh, sense of the meeting or a formal vote? Uh, a vote would be excellent. Okay. Then my proposal, uh, everybody heard, so I'll, I'll take uh, uh, Randy's agreement as a second. Um, any further discussion? If not. Just for clarity, do you want Brian to come back and speak to the commission or would you like a written report? Or my, my sense was if he could just uh, send a summary, one page or report, uh, one or two page, whatever. Uh, here's. Here's what happened, here's who was there, how many people were there, who led it, uh, how long it took, uh, what some of the content was, uh, just to give us a sense of what the event actually turned out to be. But no, not necessary. If you want to come back, it's certainly fine, but not necessary to come. You can do it could by I writing. Just, could I add one little thing, maybe if there is another event on the horizon, even just a sketch of what that might look like in that report back? Sure. 
if they have some future plans, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have to be super concrete, but if if it would be a repeat of the same thing or some other idea that has come up in the meantime, that would be just interesting and helpful for contextualizing it. Is parking gonna be an issue, access and parking? A lot of our areas don't have, you know, big huge parking lots. Well, this is Sawmill Hills. So I don't know which uh, entrance. Um, yeah, but I think. Funny. Would you like me to respond? Yeah, please. Yes, please. Sure. So um, we plan on using the Avis Circle access, and with fifteen participants, we would anticipate probably seven to eight cars maximum. Um, so we're a relatively new company. Right now we're selling about 50% of our maximum capacity. So, you know, we're looking at five to 10 people, um, a few cars, and we're aware of the, you know, the mailboxes and advising people not to park in front of mailboxes there. And um, there should be capacity for, for the, that number of cars there. Notwithstanding, you know, whatever public may show up at the same time. So that's a... a a good point to include in the uh, summary report that you send us is yeah, about how many cars actually showed up. And, um, Whether there were neighborhood complaints about all the parking problems. Well, you're right. <laughs> well, especially Ava Circle, that, that was an issue when we first opened that access many, many years ago. All right, so uh, we've had the discussion following a motion in a second. So no, all in favor, Sarah? Uh, I don't, we didn't, we had a lot of discussion, but not a motion or a second. Oh, I, I was making a proposal. I okay, thought of that as, okay. As my all right, so no, motion and, by and Kevin. Randy, Randy agreed with that, so I thought that was the second. Okay, all right, excellent. Uh, so, so vote Kevin? Yes. Mason? Guardian, yes. Jack? <laughs> Yes. Jen? Yes. Randy? Yes. Alec? Yes. Very good. Good luck. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Hope it goes well. Thank you. Um, and I, I will say, I, I will forward, the, as I said, I haven't read it yet, except the first line. Bob Zimmerman indicated that they don't like that kind of thing to happen at Fitzgerald Lake, but I'll, I'll forward to the rest of the commission Bob's email um, after I read the whole thing and we'll see. Right now we're not opening up um, Fitzgerald Lake, we're just uh, opening up Sawmill Hills for this one activity for this one um, outfit. So uh, I think we are, uh, we'll, we'll see what Bob has to say, but I'll forward yeah, it. Now. I'm curious about his drivers, because I mean, this, this kind of activity seems very consistent with what they'd yeah. like to see there. <laughs> right, exactly, you know. I, yeah, there's no dogs, uh, looking at nature, learning more. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, it seems like the right kind of stuff, but anyway, I'll, yeah, no, I'll forward well. Bob's email, so. Anything else, Sarah? Uh, the only other thing was that um, the, the notification from, it, it was formerly Columbia Gas, now Western Mass, Electric um, about their maintenance activities, which are exempt. About their what? Maintenance okay. activities, which are exempt. So it, just an FYI. Oh, it's just an FYI letter. Okay. All right. So uh, when's our next meeting? Uh, I will double check, but I am 90% sure that we do not have anything for the 22nd. Um, so if, if that is the case, and I'll let everyone uh -huh. know as soon as possible, then that it would be May 13th. May 13th, 13th. unless something comes up in the meantime, which we don't know about. All right. Um, Jen has a dog though. That, that's something exciting. Yeah, I just <laughs> a puppy. Um, oh, look at the puppy. <laughs> She's two months old. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. We just got her on Saturday, so she's very new. Oh, wow. What's her name? My son named her Elephant, but I'm calling her Ellie. <laughs> Ellie. <laughs> Ellie. Short for Elephant. Great. Yep. Well, she's really a cutie. Yeah, she really is. And a, a fine note to end our meeting on. Yeah. So 
a, a squiggly, wiggly puppy on the screen. Yeah. All right. Anything from anybody else? Any other puppies, kittens? Um, <laughs> if not, great but to see you all. Annoying cat scratching me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks Bye. very much. Bye-bye.